So you, you describe one of the ways you compare the two styles of entrepreneurial entrepreneurship between Helena Rubinstein and Eugene Schuller's. You describe Rubinstein's style as 19th century mm -hmm. and Schuller's as 20th century. In what, in what way? I mean, what, presumably you're suggesting Rubinstein's style wouldn't work in today's world, but Schuller's would? Or what are no, the, what are the implications than, it's not of quite that distinction? That. It's that the, it is that the great creation of the 20th century are these um, sophisticated scientific industrial enterprises. So he builds uh, what he builds L'Oreal, uh, which is by the 30s and 40s resembles a modern day conglomerate. Um, this kind of relentless acquisition of compatible businesses, um, this application. He um, has professional management. He um, uh, hires, uh, he, he runs, he creates new products using, he builds a massive R&D lab. When he, he builds, he's the first person to figure out how to make hair dye that's actual hair dye. I mean, that actually dyes your hair properly. I mean, hair dyes were around for years, but they, they were terrible. And if you, it's, you know, it's the origin of, of um, uh, do you remember the famous hair dye slogan? The first famous one, which was for Clairol, was, does she or doesn't she? Only her hairdresser knows for sure, right? That was in the 50s. Right. Now, the reason that slogan was so powerful was that hair dyes were so terrible up until that moment that if you dyed your hair, everyone knew you dyed your hair. So to be able to be at a point in the evolution of hair dye where the only person who would know that you had dyed your hair was your hairdresser was this huge leap. It was like the man on the moon. It, was, it changed the whole landscape of hair dye. So th the person who's driving a lot of those innovations is... Uh, is L'Oreal. Right? Of course, L'Oreal then famously comes up with because I'm worth it, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, so he's building what we would recognize today as this quintessentially modern corporation. Helena Rubinstein, Rubinstein Cosmetics, was, there was nothing modern about it. I mean, she was hiring all of her relatives. They were <laughs> expanding haphazardly here and there. She was spending all of her disposable income on bigger and more elaborate jewels and you know, the worst painting by Picasso next to the worst painting by Cezanne. Um, you know, she's this kind of over the top. Those kinds of people don't survive. You know, that kind of thing is increasingly rare these days. And it usually um, doesn't outlive the founder is one of, yeah, the, it, one of the characteristics. And she does, I mean, and that, oh, I don't know if, am I jumping no, in? No, go ahead. The great punchline to the story, of course, is that in the end, Rubenstein is bought out by L'Oreal. And the person that L'Oreal that is that engineers the buyout and is put in charge of those operations is a guy who was a famous Nazi collaborator. So can you imagine the horrible irony that a business built by um, a great Jewish entrepreneur is taken over and, by the way, run into the ground by uh, a Nazi collaborator? I mean, it's this sort of in the seven, 60s and 70s. But one of the things. I mean, that's, as you say, it's the punchline, but also one of the things that really interested me in, in your approach and what you do in that article is you, you, you bring a, more, a moral element into play. You, you introduce two other, as you say, classic stories in the entrepreneurial canon, the, the Swedish furniture manufacturer, uh, IKEA's founder, Ingvar Kamprad, and, and Oskar Schindler. Mm -hmm. How does morality come into play in these stories? What? Well, I was interested in the fact that um, we venerate entrepreneurs in our culture, right? They are our, they are our new prophets. We, literally, we worship them. If you read the literature about entrepreneurs, great entrepreneurs, it is, it is, um, uh, it is, uh, it is iconography. Iconography, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, why do we venerate them so much? Are they worthy of this? Maybe level mean of hag hagiography. Hagiography. That's right. And um, what interests me about looking very closely at entrepreneurs. And by the way, no one is more appreciative of what they, have, what they do for us than I am, or any of us are. But one thing that's very clear about them is that the greatest entrepreneurs are, are amoral. Um, it's not that they're immoral. It's that they're amoral. The reason Schuller collaborated with the Nazis in the 40s in France is not that he's a Nazi. He's not a Nazi. He's never thought more than five minutes about politics. He cares about one thing, which is L'Oreal. 
And he says, the only way I can keep this company going is if I play nice with the Nazis. I'm going to play nice with the Nazis. It doesn't occur to him that there's any moral element to that whatsoever. That's the way great entrepreneurs are. That is, they are completely single-minded and obsessively focused on the health of their enterprise. That's what makes them good at building businesses, but that's what also makes them people who are not worthy of this level of hagiography. Uh, Ingvar Kamprad, the man who founds IKEA, IKEA is founded on one brilliant decision made by Kamprad in the early 1960s, when he's facing a boycott from all of his um, fellow furniture manufacturers in Sweden. They're driving him out of business. Wait, wait one sec and just wait. That was a little capitalist that really wasn't happy with That's right. Six. Someone was objecting to this line of analysis. Um, so, so if you just go back up to Ikea's family. Oh, yes. Yeah. So okay. Ikea is built on a decision made by Ingvar Kamprad in the early 60s when he's facing ruin. He started this chain of discount furniture retailers in Sweden, and he's facing a boycott from all the Swedish... Uh, furniture manufacturers. And he's going to go out of business. And so he has this great insight, which is, oh, uh, right across the Baltic Sea from Sweden is a country which has lots and lots of really cheap labor, lots and lots of lumber, and a 500-year tradition of making furniture. Poland. I'm just going to go to Poland. He goes to Poland. Nobody went to Poland in 1963. Why? Because Poland was the enemy in 1963. They had missiles pointed at us, right? Did he care? No. He's trying to keep his business alive, right? So this is, uh, in retrospect, a brilliant act of imagination and daring and entrepreneurial, you know, daring do is also profoundly, at least morally agnostic, right? He didn't care. Are they trying to take us over and blow us up? I don't care. They're, I can make cheap furniture, right? Contrast him with Schindler. Schindler is a man who, in the middle of the Second World War, is running an enterprise. Uh, in, he's making weapons for the Nazis, and he's employing lots of Jewish labor, right? He's, uh, his factory's essentially in the, um, uh, in the uh, Jewish quarter of Warsaw or Krakow? I, I think forget. also Krakow. Also Krakow. I'm constantly making, mixing these up. And he realizes that... Um, he is, unless he can keep this up, or he realizes that he is responsible for the lives of all of these, um, uh, of all of these Jews, right? And he decides that he wants to keep them alive. How does he keep them alive? By compromising his business. Basically, he funnels all of the profits he makes into bribes. He's just bribing people. That's how he keeps it going. And then he, remember, at the end of the war, he moves his factory to be even closer, I think, to. Uh, to be away from the front, and, and he, it's very close to, I think, Auschwitz, or one of the camps. At which point, he's ceased making things at all. He's, remember, at that point, he is deliberately sabotaging the munitions he's making so they won't fire. And every penny, he's not just using his profits, but he's using every penny he owns, he has, to pay off the local Nazis so he can keep his Jewish workers alive. This guy's not an entrepreneur. He is a hero, right? But he's a hero because he's a terrible businessman, <laughs> right? And uh, by the way, after the war, he fails at every business he tries. He doesn't have that kind of, here was a man who could not keep moral considerations from impinging on his ability to run a business. He couldn't overlook the fact that, oh, my employees who I like are going to go to the camp unless I keep them here, right? Now, I promise you, Eugene Schiller did, was not visited by those same pangs of conscience. Right? That's why he was happily coexisting with the Nazis. So we need to be clear when we venerate entrepreneurs what we are venerating. These are not, they are not moral leaders. If they were moral leaders, they wouldn't be great businessmen. Right? Now some people, so when a businessman is a great moral leader, it is because they have maintained their conscience separately from their operations. They have would you, taken... Would you put Bill Gates in that? So yeah. Gates, uh, sure, is the most ruthless capitalist. And then he decides, he wakes up one morning and he says, enough. And he steps down, he takes his money, takes it off the table, and I think, I've, I firmly believe that 50 years from now, he will be remembered for his charitable work. No one will even remember what Microsoft is. And of the great entrepreneurs of this era, people will have forgotten Steve Jobs. 
Who is Steve Jobs again? But Gates will be, there will be statues of Gates across the third world. And people will remember him as the man who, you know, there's a reasonable shot. He will cure, because of his money, we will cure malaria. Yeah. Every single idea he ever had came from somebody else. And by the way, he would be the first to say this. But was he the first? Because you say he also uh, tried to take credit. Or oh, he would also take credit for things. Oh, yeah, yeah, for other famously. People's, for other people's yeah. ideas. Yes, yes. That was, he was, um, uh, he was shameless. And he was someone who, I say all of these things, he was an ex extraordinarily brilliant businessman and entrepreneur. He was also a, a self-promoter on a level that we have rarely seen. Um, think about it. Look. All the things that made him a brilliant self-promoter, were they overlapped with what made him a great businessman, right? He was brilliant at understanding the image he wanted to craft for the world. What was brilliant about Apple? He understood from the get-go that the key to success in that marketplace was creating a distinctive and powerful um, and seductive brand. And he was as good at doing that for laptops as he was doing it for himself. Look at the cover of, for goodness sake, of the, of the biography that was written about him. It's the photo, I mean, he designed the cover. Who does that, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone, someone's gonna write your biography and say, well, by the way, you can say whatever you want, but I want control over the, the packaging, right? Of course, of course he did that, but he's a, he was someone who, you know, in his, the, my favorite is the wrong word, but to me, the most extraordinary moment in the, autobi in the biography of Jobs is the description. This is Walter Isaacson's book. Walter it, Isaacson's yeah. book, which is a really tremendous book. He's on his deathbed, and he is, they are, he's undergoing one last medical procedure. And he's, you know, he's shrunken. He's, it's over, and he knows it. And they're trying to put an uh, oxygen mask over him. And on, I forget how many occasions, three, four occasions, he refuses the mask because uh, he uh, is unhappy with its design. It's just not elegant enough. <laughs> He's like, send it away, bring me back. That's who he was, right? Right to the very end, he had a set of standards about if he was gonna die, damn it, he's gonna die with the right kind of oxygen mask. <laughs> he wasn't, you know, to him it was like making him send his final emails using Windows. <laughs> I mean, it's... A man's got to draw the line somewhere, right? Um, and there's another moment when he's describing his family had, they were trying to decide which kind of washing machine to buy. And because the great European washing machines will make your clothes really, really clean, but it takes like three times longer, and the American machines, not quite as clean, but they're really quick and efficient, and they have, would have family discussions for weeks about which one to buy. Just buy the, by the way, is he really doing his laundry? This is the other question I had. He's not. <laughs> I didn't think of that. But yes, you described He's so not doing his laundry. eight weeks, his wife, and his wife is telling the story, yeah, yeah. though. You know. But she's not doing the Let's be clear. Yeah. No one's doing laundry in this relationship. <laughs> yeah. I remember interviewing a, a big a Silicon Valley billionaire. And you forget, because you meet these guys, and they're hugely powerful, wealthy people. And then you start talking to them, and of course, they sound just like you and me, and you forget they're billionaires. So I'm talking to this guy, and I go into some rant, as I often do, about why can't, he's a software guy. I said, why can't you fix the, the thing at the airport because in the security, and can't you do that better than they're doing it? I'm going on and on and on and on, because the lines are so long. And he looks at me, and I realized, oh, he hasn't been inside an airport in, he doesn't know, he doesn't know there's lines. He, he thinks that an airport is a thing that you drive up onto the runway in your car and you get out. It's like, the line, there's no line. There's a guy standing at the top who like rolls a red carpet down for me. And he's just like, he, and I was like, oh, right. Pri private jet. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Fly. I also, in the same conversation, so embarrassedly, went on and on and on about how I couldn't believe, I had this whole thing at the time, I don't do it anymore, but a whole thing at the time about the problem with most rich people is they have no imagination. So you get a lot of money and you think, okay, now you have a billion dollars, use a little imagination about how you're gonna spend it, right? Don't, you know, build a 45,000 square foot house in Mississauga. 
you know, if you, if you have a billion, you can do better than that, right? You can do it. You can go to the moon. You can, don't just, so what they invariably do, these guys, is they just do what they would have done when they were poor, only 10x. So <laughs> instead of having, buying one Corvette, they buy 10 Corvettes. Don't buy a Corvette. You don't have to. You're rich now. Anyway, so I was going on this long, long thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying... Uh, uh, you're doing this rant that you don't do anymore. I don't do it anymore because I learned my lesson. So I'm interviewing this guy and I, I of course, it doesn't sound like an interview, does it anymore? But I go into this whole thing about how all these guys, they buy yachts. Why do they buy yachts? Like, what more boring thing to do than buy a yacht, which you're only on two weeks a year, and all your friends have yachts, by the way. Like, crazy. Do something. And I go on and on. And then I go home that night and I was like, oh. And I Google this guy's name and yacht. And of course, you know, image Google. First thing I see, huge... You know, 425 foot, you know, the something, 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 right? Four names, helicopter pad. And I was like, uh, oh. the whole time. Uh. <laughs> One of the things that surprised me when you, uh, in relation to Steve Jobs is you, you say that we wrongly fetishize the idea of being first, where in fact, you don't necessarily want to be first in order to capitalize an on an idea, and Jobs was never first. Why not? I, I would have thought you needed to be first to, to get the patent or to get the copyright, or like, that that would be what people are, you know, that was significant. Who uh, was the first, who built the first social media site? Nobody remembers. Not, not Zuckerberg is what you're going to say. It was, uh, it was Friendster. Who built the second one? It was uh, probably MySpace. Uh, who built the third one? Facebook. You don't want to be first. They're long gone. You don't want to be second. You want to be third in that case. Who built the first search engine? Probably like Alta Vista or something. <laughs> and then it was Yahoo. And then it was like Lycos. And then it was something. The Google guys were so late to that party. I mean, they were massively. They slept through the first <laughs> generation of search engines. Show me an example of why you want to be first. Who was first? No one's ever first. Like the whole first, it's so weird. A, there is this sort of fetishization about it, but there are very few cases. This is only because of a, uh, application rather than research. So you have the, the computer competing scientists, like the discovery of DNA or something like that. And there, there it's significant who's first. And what we're talking about, it's a different sphere because we're just talking about, not just, but we're talking about the ability to capitalize on an idea to... Yeah. Well, you want to be first-ish. You want to be in the first wave. <laughs> you don't want to be a hundredth. But um, I don't know if you ever... And also, the other problem with the first is, there's so many problems with being first. I was having this conversation. You remember Michael Milken, the guy who went to jail in the 80s for junk bond stuff? Um, so I was talking to some guy, and he was like, you know, everyone does what Michael Milken did. It's just that he was first. And it was so weird, and like, people couldn't figure it out. And they're like, oh, it must be criminal. And so they put him, sent him to jail, and they barred him from the securities industry. And now everyone does it. And it was like, oh. So you didn't want to be first doing that, because you went to jail. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't think first is, I just think it's overrated. Wouldn't you rather be second or third and see how the guy who went first did? <laughs> and then want to improve it if you could, right? Is that, um, how, is that how they win? Because they improve or they- Yeah, they that was the thing about Jobs. Jobs was never first. He was late to every single party. He was, you know, they were Blackberries years before there was the iPhone. There was, he, the, the Mac was a copy of the computer he saw at Xerox Park. Uh, the, uh, he did an MP3 player because he was disgusted with it. He so hated the music players he had. He's like, we can do better than this. The tablet is an idea, the iPad is an idea that was, uh, was Microsoft's idea. And he went to a dinner party and the developer of the tablet from Microsoft talked his ear off and he got, found the guy so annoying, he was like, you know what, I'm gonna do my own. No, no, the reason he was upset was that the Microsoft guy wanted to do a stylus with the iPad. And Steve Jobs, among his many universities, he hated styluses, styli. <laughs> and he just, if you mention the word stylus, he would literally like, Blow his stack. So he's like, if you're going to do it with a stylus and ruin it, I'm doing it myself, right? With the finger. Um, so he did, so he's never, like, he had no, he didn't, I don't think he even wanted to be, it never occurred to him that he wanted to be. He was quite happy ripping people off. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think when ideas get really complicated and then when the world gets complicated, it's foolish to think the person who's first can work it all out. 
um, that you know most good things are. It takes a long time to figure them out. So, another entrepreneurial idea that you debunk is that uh, entrepreneurs are great risk takers. You use Ted Turner, the media advertising mogul, as an example, but you suggest that the really big movers are, in fact, don't take risks. I mean, yeah. how? how do well, they... I yeah, I was reminded. I read this hilarious thing recently. Somebody was describing the founders of Google as risk-taking entrepreneurs. And then this guy writes a response, this guy who was also an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, who points out that they were both PhD graduates from Stanford uh, in engineering in the 1980s. And the phrase that sticks in my head was, short of inheriting the throne of England, there is no one who has taken less of a risk than a PhD graduate in computer science and engineering from Stanford. His point is, if you get a PhD in computer science from Stanford in the 1980s, people line up to give you money for whatever you want to do. They didn't, I mean, they are brilliant guys. They did amazing things. They did not take risks. Other people gave them money, which they spent on a whole bunch of ideas, which paid off, right? That's many things. It's not risk taking. The risks that entrepreneurs take, I think, are social risks. So what they do, that was what that article was all about, was understanding the risks they take are not material risks. They're very often using other people's money. Or more interestingly, what makes them brilliant entrepreneurs is they understand a business that's not risky. Everyone else thinks it's risky, but it's actually not. Their genius is understanding that something is a far surer bet than the rest of the world thinks. Ted Turner is a great example. Ted Turner is the first guy that understood he was running a uh, billboard business, and he wanted to buy a cable television station. And, and incidentally, inherited the billboard business yeah. from his father. From his father. Wants to buy a cable television station. Everyone says, that's crazy. You're going to lose your shirt. And he's like, no, I'm going to do it anyway. What he realized, which we all now understand, is that billboards <laughs> and television stations are the same business. They're in the business of selling ads. right? The fit between those two was beautiful. And he buys a station for next to nothing and turns it into one of the most powerful lucrative media properties in the world. The risk he took was social. All of the business old guard of Atlanta, when he made that move, essentially ostracized him and called him an idiot. That is, to be called an idiot by your peers is a very devastating thing, right? And all, if you look at the careers of great entrepreneurs and you look at the moment that they took their plunge, the plunge is rarely a great financial or material risk. It's a social risk. At the moment they started their new business, everyone around them said, you're an idiot. And they had to endure years and years and years of essentially being a pariah. That is insanely difficult. That's way harder than gambling with someone else's money. right? Uh, Sam Walton borrows money from his relatives to start Walmart. Borrowing money from your relatives is not a material risk. It's a social risk. If you blow it, and if you're doing something your relatives are rolling their eyes at, every time you go to Christmas or Thanksgiving, <laughs> your father-in-law is looking you, you know, looking daggers at you and saying, you're going to squander my money, son, right? That's the risk, right? But the idea of running a discount retailer where you pay your workers almost nothing and you lock them in at night so they can't go home, that's not financially risky. That's, that turns out to be a fabulous business proposition. Who knew that, who knew that exploiting people could make a lot of money. Like, what is, what a... What uh, active imagination. Brilliant active imagination. <laughs> I will get stuff from China where they pay their workers nothing, and I will sell it in stores in America where I pay my workers nothing, and that will translate into a huge amount of money. 